Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Turnips Digest, uh, pre-recorded for the second time. Uh, I am joined today by Mr. Stephen Wolf. How are you doing, sir? Great, great. Thanks for having me on. I'm, yeah, very glad to have you on uh, because you've uh, contributed quite a number of works that have uh, uh, stirred uh, the usual suspects and have uh, uh, got the praise of a few good friends of mine. So uh, for a while, mm -hmm. I've wanted to have you on to talk to you. And uh, last semester, uh, the last few months, that is, uh, those plans kind of fell through as I got busier and busier. And uh, you put out a tweet <laughs> basically asking, uh, uh, how, how do we cooperate with... Uh, with the uh, based Lutherans, I think the name was. So um, yeah, that that's yeah. a direct predecessor to this discussion right here. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, I'm doing great. I mean, that, that tweet was uh, kind of a response. Uh, I think it was about an hour earlier, I, I had talked with a Lutheran, a Lutheran pastor. And uh, it, I the conversation was interesting because he mentioned it being, being Lutheran, some kind of differences and, and similarities. But uh, and so I was thinking, how do I, you know, I've, I've talked with Baptists and Roman Catholics and Anglicans, and I have uh, close friends in, in all those camps. Uh, but how does a, a Presbyterian become friends with a Lutheran? And uh, um, <laughs> uh, as a guy growing up in places that uh, where there weren't many Lutherans, that, that was kind of a question that popped in my head. But but here I am, you know, I'm talking to Lutheran. So, yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. So, uh Unfortunately, I can't give you the title of first uh, Presbyterian that has been on my show. I've had, a, I think, a couple so far. Uh, most recently okay. would be Mr. Grant Brooks, uh, who is a, a pretty good historian of American, hist historian of American history, um, hmm. who uh, was previously on here to talk about specifically Presbyterianism and American history, um, okay. sort of bringing to light that story. Uh, not many people would know the uh, an intimate intertwining of American development throughout history and Presbyterian theology and Presbyterian uh, laymen and ministers, so uh, th that, that ended up being a pretty good story. Um, however, I don't think I have had a Presbyterian on to discuss uh, specifically um, you know, religious discussions, so um, that's going to be the brunt of this uh, stream, I have a feeling. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to go there, though. Um, most people uh, that are familiar with you and my audience might recognize you as writing A Case for Christian Nationalism, uh, which is a uh, book that went out a few, was it a few months ago, or has it been out longer than that? You'll have to correct me. Yeah, it's uh, November 1st. All righty. So, yeah, yeah, about three, three months or so. And I remember when it came out, uh, you know, I, I uh, follow a few uh, people on Twitter just to gauge uh, what the opposite of me basically is. Uh, is reacting to and looking at and what they're saying um, and they were absolutely infuriated by it it seemed like and then the uh, <laughs> friends that I have uh, Presbyterian or otherwise had a lot of good things to say about the book um, mm. they were posting some very uh, very favorable quotes out of it um, and it seems like that really brought to the forefront a discussion about Christian nationalism outside mm. of electoral politics and all this other stuff just as a uh, guiding philosophy uh, for a Christian right-wing movement to go forward, um, yeah. uh, do you think that's a character or a uh, charitable characterization? I mean, I think it. I. I mean, I, ho I hope it's true that it does start a, a movement um, of some kind. I, I, I. If people don't like the term, like I, I'm not out to kind of attach myself to some movement that's going to take over the world. Though I kind of, you know, I, of course, I hope that we have we success. We have success, but. Uh, if if someone wants to call it something else, but they still they still keep the substance or whatever, that that's fine. Um, but it, yeah, I didn't just write it to write an academic piece. I wrote it so that people would be convinced of the arguments and act upon them. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean the the response has been really fascinating. I, I didn't know. I, I knew that it would be. I knew that that it would that that would be a lot of that there would be a lot of negativity and a lot of positivity in different camps just because I understand the dynamics of the internet and there's people who th their entire thing is to point out how some other guy is uh, you know a the theocrat or a racist or, or a fascist or whatever that's their whole thing and so they're going to jump in an opportunity to to kind of pull a quote out of a book and say oh look where everything we suspected is true. Um, and then they, they generate all this buzz and then other, so there's all these dynamics that I knew that happened, but it was, uh, the fact that the, the book has been reviewed at, at, in basically every major evangelical outlet, uh, and as I understand it, maybe twice from, uh, um, the gospel coalition, 
uh, the next week or so. I mean, it's been it's been great. I mean, most of those reviews are negative, of course. But what do you expect? You think Gospel Coalition would publish a review that was positive? I think it's um, beneficial uh, for you if the Gospel Coalition goes against your work, but uh, that might be a discussion for later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and, I mean, you, you knew that was coming, but uh, but I, and, and that's not to say all the. So I, I think a lot of the reviews were not excellent, but uh, th they had good responses and a lot to think about. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was. Uh, but it's very much a mixed audience, so like it, it's not as if the like the Anglicans. As if like, as if all like there were like some Anglicans like it, some don't, some Presbyterians like it, some don't, some Baptists. Some, so it wasn't along like these denominational lines. And uh, so, but I mean, yeah, it was, it, it was pretty interesting to see how it kind of took off. Right. And uh, I believe I mentioned earlier that it, uh, it stirred up the usual suspects, uh, the sort mm -hmm. of uh, either overt or pseudo progressive uh protestants at the very least that will uh uh you know seek to bring their church body closer to uh what might be termed worldly progressivism uh towards mm -hmm. a complete condemnation of all things that uh the world currently finds unfashionable uh you know racism sexism uh the usual isms um those types uh seemed absolutely apoplectic uh that this work was uh uh, you know, gaining ground amongst yeah. other people, um, and, and the Lutherans in particular, who uh, oftentimes view themselves as either a middle way between the evangelicals and the Catholics, which uh, I personally think is an absolutely uh, uh, counterintuitive way of viewing it, um, or for some people that just uh, view it as a distinct body for whatever other reason, um, Christian nationalism became a sort of a flashpoint issue um, mm -hmm. a few months ago that's still kind of ongoing. Uh, where you'll have the more left or moderately aligned Lutherans using it as a slur, um, and then you'll have people that do just profess the ideas in it, and they will just uh, proudly say, yes, I do believe that the nation should be uh, Christian. So um, this work has pervaded not just the sort of uh, the, uh, the usual evangelical sphere. Uh, you were mentioning the Gospel Coalition, Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, the usual American denominations, um, but the Lutherans too, uh, seem to have uh, uh, joined the discussion at least internally, uh, where yeah. where there are now uh, two camps basically that view this either as the the worst thing to come around in the modern times since <laughs> all the other worst things to come around, or there are some people that are holding to it and saying this is a very sensible way forward. So, yeah. uh, you know, d don't undersell yourself in that regard. It seems to have uh, uh, it seems to have a uh, driven conversation. Certainly, you have to take a side. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, and what I expected and what's kind of come true is that there would be this initial, uh, support and then eventually, and partly because again, the dynamics of how, <clears throat> how life is now, but, but that eventually the, the camps, the, the different denominations, or I should say theological traditions, um, would, would begin to look at it and say, okay, fine, we, we agree with this, we don't agree with that. And eventually there would be like things happen, there'd be these kind of disagreements internally about what is Christian nationalism and, and how you understand it. And, uh, and I think, and, and it's good to see that's happening in each, each different camp. I know that like the, the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention or the Southern Baptist, uh, mainly through uh, William Wolfe uh, uh, and others and Tom Askell, they brought this topic up there. Like Tom, I guess Tom Askell is a little kind of, you know, apprehensive to use the, the term, but but there is that discussion is happening in those circles. And, and I expect within the gen general assemblies, I'm sure someone's going to bring up uh, Christian nationalism in either OPC or uh, PCA, and it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's good to see. And I and I, what I hope moving forward, and I, I have not been the greatest at this, partly because I'm not. I'm an academic. I'm not a movement leader, so that's my excuse. But it's it's really not a good excuse. But to try to bring people like together on this, again, not to like say I'm the leader of a movement, but just to say how do we work this out? We all live in the same place and you know country, whatever, and we we need to sort this out and uh, and <clears throat> come to some come to some kind of understanding agreement. Otherwise, this just turns into another controversy that we just end up just killing each other over. Um, right. figuratively and literally uh so <laughs> so um this uh ties very neatly in with some of the things that i've discussed previously on this channel with other guests 
Um, first, I believe, back in September of last year, um, earlier this year, uh, very early in January, um, there's been a big question among some people on the right. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, advancements and developments and in, uh, in political analysis and uh, different ways to view how uh, how the governments and companies and all this other stuff in the world work and how they're currently uh, uh, well to put it very directly destroying traditional civilization um, and that's led to a lot of Christians in these spheres wondering well what can we do um, because there's certainly a group among each of the different traditions and denominations uh, that would like to say, ignore all of that. Uh, we need to keep fighting this fight that's been going on for a few decades now, where it's brand name versus brand name. It's uh, mm. LCMS versus PCA versus all these other things. Uh, basically trying to pretend that uh, these theological uh, arguments are at the forefront rather than, uh, you know, discussions about, you know, the very creation of uh, from God, it's God himself, uh, you know, issues surrounding uh, sex, gender, uh, race, all this other stuff that has been so constantly uh, attacked by the state, by the companies, by all these other uh, actors that are in league with each other. Um, all of these different uh, cliques within these denominations, um, it seems, are trying to ignore that, pretend it doesn't exist for whatever reason, and just try to focus on a fight that they know how to fight. Uh, and I'm not going to prescribe uh, malicious motives right now. But then we have this uh, sort of sphere that I'm in, and it seems to have reached out at least tangentially to the audience of your book, that is wondering, you know, what can Christians do? We, we know that this is happening. We know that there's a lot of false fights going on right now, a lot of things that are just trying to keep your attention and not much else. What can be done? So a lot of the discussions that I've been trying to have are, you know, how can we Christians cooperate across, uh, across factional or denominational lines? Um, so we've tossed around ideas of a uh, of coalitions where you don't necessarily have to come to a conclusion on sacramental theology, justification, all the other things that uh, uh, Christendom has fought itself over for the last few centuries. But we can agree that um, you know the current people inhabiting the state, inhabiting companies, inhabiting NGOs, whatever else you want to add to that list, are enemy. Um, and that seems to tie in nicely with your idea of Christian nationalism, because it uh, it had an appeal to people across traditions. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, so I mean, um, yeah, well, I, I, th this is one of those questions that as I was writing the book, I kept kind of thinking through, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do now? Uh, and in my the the epilogue is kind of a, a weird a way to try to get at that without actually giving an action plan, uh, the, how to act. I and I, I kind of said, well, you know what, we, we need the someone else to do this. Um, but I, it is a it is a very difficult situation. And one of the reasons why in that I didn't write a conclusion that said, now here's step A, what we do now, is it's actually a very difficult. It's a very difficult question, and and um. What I was hoping as I is I'd write the book and then these very questions would arise and then people would kind of ask themselves, what do we do now? And it would start a conversation and kind of what we're doing now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think that uh, as I mean, again, I don't know like where Lutherans are on this, but I do think as as Protestants, we can actually have a lot of uh, we, we can recognize uh, spiritual unity among brethren. Um, and still have disagreements, even in, uh, in political matters, but in, in certainly in theology, but still uh, seek some kind of uh, country and nation, uh, some kind of nation that uh, can, at least in a sort of pan-Protestant sense, become Christian. Uh, and, and so that, that's like, that, that's, I guess, the end goal. Uh, I, that doesn't say what to do at this immediate moment. And how to work towards that? I mean, there, in, in terms of that, there's there there are options of. I, I mean, I think one thing is that the state governors need to be more assertive. Uh, certainly, local officials need to be more assertive. Um, and we should. We, I think part of it is that like we as Christians need to start talking to one another about how kind of abnormal we are in, in, in relation to the history of the church. I mean, the history of Christianity is our Christians saying, this is my Christian place and I'm going to defend it. And this is, this is a Christian 
land. This is a Christian people. And we're going to use the powers God has ordained in order to make it that way or and to keep it that way. So it's not it's not just that we have to come up with an action plan, like how are we going to go through elector politics to win? I mean, we should think about that. We should also think about how do we talk to our fellow Christians who are so thoroughly modernized in their thinking in politics that they can't even conceive of the idea that you'd have a public school with prayer. I mean, just just a generic prayer would to, to most evangelicals would seem, it seems to me like that most would find that odd and maybe and probably wrong. Even though there's people still living to this day who went through that and uh, but but I think we've been so socialized in a certain secularist modernism or a, a modern secularism that we uh, can't fathom. But the, the, the point being, I think we need to we need to start uh, kind of use this moment in which things have been kind of disrupted to then inject in these ideas of, hey, we're weird. Like you're our modern minds are weird in relation to the rest of the church. And maybe. Uh, maybe that that tradition has something to teach us and we should actually kind of change our thinking in that regard. So, I mean, I, 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 do you have any thoughts? I mean, what oh, well, are Lutherans yeah. saying in, in, the, in the Discord channels or whatever? That they... <laughs> um, I Well, I guess I am till, still technically on Discord, but I've since uh, moved on to okay. other platforms. Uh, <laughs> okay. But uh, um, at least the... Uh, at least the cohorts that I'm within, um, it is a very popular line of questioning of... Uh, Ultimately, the uh, there's a few different memes that are tossed around. That's like, uh, if these uh, if these social causes that the church now supports are such huge and monumental and fundamental things, why can't I find justification for supporting them until 50 years ago or something like that? It all boils down to, you know, uh, the modern church has uh, so completely gone off the path that at this point, either everyone in the last 50 years is right, and every single person that came before them is wrong. <laughs> or every single person that came before them for the, like the last two millennia were right and it's simply the last few decades that we've gone off the rails um, that, that's what the questions ultimately boil down to uh, <laughs> I mean with the sort of figures that you would see on say uh, Twitter that are Lutherans um, the bigger names uh, I have uh, disparaged some of them by calling them gatekeepers um, I originally got on their uh, got on their naughty list if you will uh, by asking questions of, you know, if I believe that the thing I use just for an intellectual exercise was racism, if that's really the gigantic sin that you're making it out to be, the giant haunting sin that's hiding behind every corner, uh, why can't I find the concept or the word being discussed until at least, you know, a century ago? You know, where are the 400 extra years of context to this that, uh, that backs up your assertion? Because otherwise... Yeah. The only logical conclusion is that you've simply strayed away from your uh, predecessors, your forefathers in the faith. Um, and, and I know I'm not alone in asking things like that. Obviously, you know, we're not all just some sort of, uh, you know, crypto racist trying to justify that. We can ask the same thing about gender and sexuality. Um, where is this discussion of gender uh, before the last 60 years? Uh, you know, the, the category just seems not to have really existed, especially not in the way that it's currently being used. Where is the discussion of uh you know wealth redistribution and all this other stuff in the modern sense um you know wh where's the talk of usury uh would be another example now entirely gone from the discussion but you can go back and find oh i don't know a thousand years worth of it up until i don't know 1940 maybe being generous <laughs> yeah th this is something that the lutherans have definitely caught on to and i see it in other traditions as well and this might uh dovetail nicely into your point um I and a few others have definitely come to the conclusion um, that conservative Lutherans, conservative Presbyterians, conservative Baptists, and whatnot else have much more in common than conservative Lutherans and liberal Lutherans do, or conservative Presbyterians and liberal Presbyterians. Uh, you know, the ELCA yeah. that flies trans flags and has uh, you know trans bishops and whatnot else that are also somehow still women. Uh, I don't think that we necessarily have much in common with them. And then even within the LCMS, the extreme progressive wing that's calling out for basically uh, a thinly veiled racial Marxism, I don't really have as much in common with them as I probably do with you, even though we are technically um, in different denominations, at least, uh, or at least explicitly. So 
That's not to say that we agree on everything. That's not to say that we're absolutely one in confession. But we do have, just as a, as a category, more in common than we do with the progressive wings of our own denominations or brands. Uh, and I've, I've, I've been sort of pushing that line of reasoning sort of to shift perspective. Um, because I feel like if more people realize that, um, more people can cooperate. It's much easier to put aside uh, doctrinal differences to combat, uh, you know, the insidious evil that's going through the churches right now, that's gone through the corporations, gone through communities, government, and all this other, all the other spheres of life. Um, I, I feel like a, uh, a coalition, if you will, would be much more feasible if that fact is recognized, but perhaps you differ with me. No, I, I, yeah, I, I entirely agree with that. Uh, I mean, I, I come at it from the, 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 like I said before, the principle that, I mean, and of, of this, this kind of this spiritual unity, the unity that we already have, and we have these theological differences. But uh, you know, apart from all that, uh, we yeah, we have this. We have a common enemy that wants to kind of mutually destroy us, and the and us uh, us like you know fighting over theology uh, is fine. But it, that that can also be used as if that if that means that as a political coalition, therefore we. we have to part ways, then that means that essentially we're we're dividing, we're being di divided up, and then we're going to be you know conquered. So uh, it's it, it's it's a difficult thing because our like I, you know, within especially like the Calvinist and you know like the Presbyterian Lutheran and uh, like traditions, they kind of want to argue. They they know their stuff, like they know their theology, and they wanted to kind of duke it out. And I, I you know I'm one of those guys too. I, I don't mind having a theological argument. Um, but I think that, yeah, we all need to, to shift our, our thinking and have be more, um, uh, understand that we face like this common enemy that wants to basically destroy us. And, right. but, but I think you're right too. Uh, you're also right that, you, that the, that the conservatives in the denominations are certainly more similar, uh, than, than the people within their own denominations. Which means I should care just as much about what happens in, you know, Lutheran Missouri Synod and as I do in the OPC or PCA or SBC. Um, even even the Roman Catholics, even though sometimes I chuckle at the fact that, you know, the whole anyway, we'll get into that. But but I mean, e even like Roman, you want to see positive things happen um in, in these denominations and traditions because you're kind of in, in a way all the, all in this in this together. And I mean, one of the one of the things I hope, I and mean, one of the things that, like you know, or like early American or around the founding era, there of there was of course, uh, most people thought in terms of like their identification to use kind of modern language would be a bit more state centric. That they were from Virginia, they were from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, and so there are people who wanted states' rights, and there are people who wanted more national government. And there was all those divisions and all that. When when George Washington in his farewell address. He he knew that he was like the American Caesar. That in a sense he was the unifier. Everyone loved George Washington, right? He could have been king if he wanted to be. Um, but then in the end of the farewell address, he says essentially we we have these common religion, we have common culture, we fought we we fought in the same struggle, and uh, we won together. We were victorious together. Therefore, I'm leaving. The Caesar's going away. He's retiring. He's done. Uh, but we need we need to get together. And so my, my hope is that if we can unite around this common struggle, that in the end, even despite these differences, just like, you know, as as much as Pennsylvania is different from South Carolina, that that there would be still be able to kind of form this this unity in the end. I mean, this is long term thinking. Uh, but I but yeah, but that starts up front with saying, OK, we, we have a common enemy. Despite our differences, we need to actually fight against this. And, um, you know, co-belligerence against that enemy, despite the fact we have disagreements. Right. And, you know, before I get accused uh, by some people that are now undoubtedly uh, going through my content after this last week with the, uh, <laughs> with the Lutheran Church Catechism, um, I am not saying, uh, just, to, I've already said this, but I am not saying that the Presbyterians and Lutherans um, are the same theologically. What I am saying, though, uh, as Mr. Wolf just articulated, is that we do have a common enemy, and it is absolutely foolish not to recognize that and to use that to our advantage. 
um, especially when that enemy is hellbent on destroying us quite literally. So, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't take the concept too terribly far. The great misconstruer going through this. Um, that being said, however. Um, we don't really have any formal organization now, and that's definitely to our detriment. Um, the, mm. the more progressive Christians, uh, even the ones that, uh, you know, I would be uh, uh, probably wrong to call Christians at this point, and they might be uh, progressive pagans that look like Christians, uh, and some of the stuff coming out of the ELCA, for instance, uh, makes one wonder. Um, they are organized. They are part of many different organizations that all push the same thing. Um, they are part of very... Mm. Uh, probably different fraternities and all this other stuff that are the same across churches. Um, they have something that I'm sure we would never go to just because the whole point that we are fighting for is our, our doctrines, our beliefs, our heritage. Um, they're in fellowship, which is a very strong organizational measure. We can't do that, but we do need something alternative that doesn't sacrifice the things that we are fighting for, but that does bring the organization. Um, and in one of the previous streams that I had, um, the idea that came up was ju literally just a formal coalition uh, with the baseline that got thrown around, and this is still a, c a cooking idea, if, you'll, uh, if you understand. Um, the idea was basically Christians are people that can affirm the Nicene Creed, for instance. Um, you know, that's, that's your baseline. You cut out, say, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, who not else. Um, and any anyone else inside of that, the conservative parts of those denominations should be working together and an explicit formal structure. So uh, I think the uh, thing that got tossed around was, you know, you would have a section for Protestants, uh, the Presbyterians, Anglicans, Lutherans, uh, Baptists, uh, just because they have more in common as Protestants uh, than perhaps some of the structural differences. You could potentially place them alongside Catholics. I don't think that would work well, which would then mean you'd have a different organization for Catholics and Orthodox. Um, the conservative parts, once again, just because the principle that we laid out was that I, as a conservative Lutheran, uh, have more of a vested interest in hoping that the uh, Presbyterian conservatives went out because I like them more than the liberal Presbyterians. Uh, same with the conservative Baptists, the conservative Catholics even. You laughed earlier. Uh, we could sidestep the topic, but that's not quite in the character of this channel. Um, I would go so far as to say that... Uh, that I do prefer the conservative Catholics over the liberal ones, um, because even though the more liberal Catholics or the progressive Catholics uh, make overtures towards unity and reconciliation, um, I think it's borne out time and time again that that's usually false. Uh, I much prefer, or I much more prefer to have a uh, a more traditional Roman Catholic just say we do not agree on this, and I believe this is the logical consequence of that, than to have a liberal Catholic come up to me and say. We mostly agree with the same things, uh, but we have a variety of different things to which you we may consider you hellbound or we may not. It really depends on the day. Um, s side tangent, but that is to say, um, I think a logical next step would be to have a formal coalition or organization without hmm. compromising confession. Yeah, th th that would be that would be great. Um... One of the one of the challenges here, I mean, there's several challenges to this. Uh, as someone who has been always uh, barely in these, well, not always, but uh, kind of in these things and then not and then out for various reasons. Um, but one of the one of the difficulties is usually the the money that you need usually need money to have some formal thing, uh, and the, if we know that's obvious. <clears throat> Uh, and but, but another issue is is two things. One, it it uh, people get people even when you're right wing, people get spooked by people by some people. So like where well, I'm, I'm like a no a no cancel to the right type guy. You know, I'm the guy who I I don't punch right um, because I think there's already enough people who do that. I only punch left. Um, and I, I might punch third way or whatever, but, uh, but I don't punch right. And uh, so I'm one of those guys. And, uh, and I think people know that about me, but there's a lot of people, even my friends who they may not punch right, but they still don't want to hang around with that guy on the right. He's a little goofy, um, or what, or whatever it is, or he's, uh, he's a, he's a loose cannon. And uh, I think, well, the point being, I'm not trying to kind of like, you know, be a black pill on formal organization. I'm just saying. 
part of it will have to be us trying to restore or not restore, uh, uh, like, like remind people as best we can that we can't be this cancel happy, typical center right person. Because that's the, the favorite, the favorite pastime of the center right is canceling people an inch to the right. Okay. That's, that's been happening since the eighties. It happened when the whole William Bennett, Mel Bradford thing. And it was in 1982. It's been happening against the paleocons and others from Paul Godfrey to everyone is all these people on the paleocon, right? Always canceled from the center, right? Um, and so we need to start thinking, okay, we can't cancel and, uh, uh, people are right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think that would be excellent. Uh, I, yeah, I I don't know. I, I'd love to hear the the plans more. I, I know that some friends of mine have have done want to do something like that as well. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I think this is something we should talk about more. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, and that's going to have to be a private conversation. Obviously, it would be a uh, rather remiss to live stream discussions of a uh, yeah. <laughs> organizational planning. Um, Probably be bored. Yeah, I'm boring. Uh, that being said, though, um, <laughs> um. I obviously I don't expect you to just be completely uh, uh, aware of you know my audience, my wider sphere, and all this other stuff. Uh, you you are a productive person in other parts of the world, uh, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, I I don't uh, think that I or the other people I'm talking to would be uh, too terribly pleased with a center right coalition of conservative Christians. <laughs> I think that we would uh, yeah. uh, want a very uh, almost uncompromising uh, traditional uh, cohort, if you will. Um, so the, everything you just said will definitely, uh, land with everyone watching this. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, I think that we've had a few academics in our own, in my own sphere that have been, uh, you know, basically canceled by their universities for one reason or another, um, while the center right either applauded along, helped, or just sort of silently watched. So, um, yeah. uh, and, you know. A lot of the intellectual development behind the people that I'm affiliated with, behind the uh, people that I talk to, um, definitely comes as a result of those paleocons and paleolibertarians um, who have spent basically the last few decades warning about the fashionable, respectable center right that kind of gets thrown into the media, um, you know, warning about how snake-like they are. They will absolutely throw you under the bus if it turns out that you... Uh, have uh, displeased the progressive gods and uh, spoken a heretical racism or something like that. Um, yeah, that, that, that's all well understood here. Um, however, um, some people, um, especially the audiences, just because uh, if you communicate a point to a, li a larger audience, it's just a rule that it will get simplified and boiled down into something that's a bit more simplistic. Um, some people have taken that warning um, to mean that you shouldn't have standards at all for who you affiliate with, which is uh, uh, dumb. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's a. Uh, there are other organizations that are currently being built right now. Uh, one that I'm affiliated with would be the Old Glory Club. Uh, so obviously, okay. by the title, not ne necessarily religious focused, even though it's very friendly to that. Um, and in fact, I think uh, we have a couple of articles in there now about the. Uh, catechism controversy with the LCMS just from a sort of United States culture and American history perspective. Um, anyways, all that to say that uh, that is going to be an example, a successful example, hopefully, if uh, we get everything sorted out, um, hmm. of having these set standards while also having a formal organization that isn't just center-right. You know, it's something that is uh, advocating for what we want. It's not compromising with other people just to get meaningless uh, gestures and token concessions. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds great. I mean, uh, along my, um, I, I'm, I'm trying, I, I know there's people trying to, uh, just to strengthen like Chronicles magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with that magazine. Yes. yes. So that's an old paleocon magazine. And, and, uh, I, I have, I have friends who are, including myself, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways right now. I mean, as of very recently, I had to bring that um, bring that kind of the forefront of the discussion. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we, yeah, like that, that, that magazine can become the sort of thing we're talking about here, which is a, an outlet for paleo conservative Christian ideas that push back against center, right. But also, um, kind of, kind of re revitalize American, uh, like the, the West. Um, so 
Yeah, I, I mean that that's great, and it's good that people are. I know that people are having these these conversations. I am I am kind of in the back rooms, I guess, or the uh, uh, and uh, that's good. Uh, and I, yeah, right. And uh, more specifically, I know that you uh, you know part of the, like I said at the beginning, one of the things that prompted this was uh, you know Lutherans in particular in this. Uh, where are they in this broader uh, idea or discussion or movement or whatnot else? Um, uh, so we, we, you know, we've talked about the general uh, for, you know, a few minutes now. Um, and I will say from what I've heard with the Lutherans is that you, uh, there are definitely people that have either read your work and are in agreement with the, uh, you know, the political or the social implications, the organizational implications, um, yeah. or they have held those conclusions already. You know, like you said, it wasn't a... So it wasn't an academic thesis where we were coming up with something absolutely new. Um, in fact, a lot of the stuff in it uh, seemed to be lessons that have been learned uh, from past movements, uh, especially within Christianity, or at least from the excerpts that I saw um, and from the parts mm -hmm. that I read myself. Um, now, on the other hand, like every other denomination, as we've talked about before now, um, you, know, you have sympathizers, but then you also have other people that will pull out uh, completely unrelated doctrine um, to basically make an argument for why this uh, modern secularism that arose out of the 1960s was actually the real Christian way of doing things forever. Uh, mm. <laughs> you know, some, yeah. Somehow our doctrine has supported the, uh, the incorporation of the First Amendment into the uh, state governments, uh, despite the fact that we never even once spoke about such a thing until it happened. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, we have people that will do that as well, um, but you know that that's just the lay of the land. The biggest appeal that you have, and the, the biggest appeal that uh, any of the uh, supporters of Christian nationalism have, um, is that it is entirely unapologetic um, to the very destroyed nature of the uh, of Western civilization in the current day. Um, hmm. it, it's one of the few groups within Christendom that is willing to say. Um, our churches should not be like this. They are in error by advocating, you know, whatever the new fad for the modern culture is. Um, and in fact, we should be pushing back against these things. And moreover, you know, we should be pushing back against this paradigm that was brought about a few decades ago, this sort of secularism that's pervaded our country, uh, something entirely foreign to our founding, uh, to the development of the country for a century or so. Um, that, that's the appeal, is the uh, sort of unapologetic pushback. And that's uh, also, you know, I'm sure you've noticed the correlation, why it's attracting youthful members in particular. Um, because that's uh, that's what youth is going to be drawn towards, is something unapologetic, something that is hard, uh, very directly principled. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, opposition I don't think matters, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at college. I, I can see the uh, very terrible state of Generation Z. Um, they, they are hardliners in some senses for the ones that do care, um, for the ones that aren't apathetic, um, but they can go either way. Um, but that's, uh, if you were to focus on that, it would be sort of obscuring what you should be focusing on. Um, there is going to be a contingency of the youth, of Generation Z, younger millennials, I, I don't know how far you want to characterize that, that will be drawn towards a more radical Christianity. Not that radical is bad. It's just uh, they want something that's uncompromising. They don't just mm -hmm. want a uh, uh, you know modern society draped in Christian aesthetic. Um, so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure that's a pattern you can see in other denominations, but that's how it is in Lutheran uh, in the Lutheran Church, especially. Um, th th those are the demographic patterns you can see. Yeah, some some of my uh, friends <clears throat> after reading the book. They, they were. I don't know if they were surprised because they know me. But uh, one of the criticisms they had was that rhetorically, it didn't kind of maximize its popular appeal. Because if you read the book, I very rarely say, you know, say I, I say something and like, well, but I don't, but I, I don't mean this in a racist way. I don't mean this in a xenophobic way. I mean, I, I don't mean to. I'm not trying to be misogynist. Or I'm not. I, I don't. I don't say those. I don't you know, that constantly kind of disclaim the baddies in the book. So I just state it very directly and uh, I try to use argumentation. I don't just, uh, I don't, I don't use like emotion. I don't use like passive aggression. Um, <clears throat> I try to use as best I could, except for like some places, places where I literally say I'm speaking freely here. Um, 
uh, I try to use very like solid argumentation because I'm appealing to people, people's minds, particularly young men or just men in general. In, in mind, I didn't have the like, you know, the, the broad like American public. I had the public. I had the idea of a a like a, a man who wants to be treated like a man, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, addressed as a man, not as like this emotional being bounded by the gynocracy and women looking over their shoulders. So that's what I did. I spoke to them. I tried to speak to them directly, knowing that like 90% people would be offended and uh, they would act out on Twitter to try to appeal to the the women who follow them or whatever. Like that's, I knew that that's kind of what they would do. But then there's that 10% who are uh, like aware of, of the world or at least some sense of the world that something's wrong. And that being kind of dominated by this kind of sensational, you know, feminism or whatever is is wrong and, and bad, and it's demeaning to men. Uh, and so I knew that there would be that. The point being, I knew there would be this minority of of guys and some women who just who would like this a lot. Uh, and so I, that's the kind of the audience that that I spoke to. Because some people, it I, I, I it since it seems nowadays that like if. Some some a lot of people are just not, they're they're not gonna they're not going to accept it they're not going to no matter how uh, solid the argumentation is no matter how historical it is no matter how ridiculous their own view is they're not going to uh, they don't have the kind of intellectual mental will to say that's that's false because they they basically exist they swim in this sort of um, this environment in which they can't possibly affirm that and if they did it would like crumble their social relations also. anyway but um uh but th that's the audience i was appealing to so i'm glad to, i'm glad to hear i know like you know you're saying lutherans and there's i know there's some presbyterians and baptists who are, who are clinging to this and part of my like I, part of my idea wasn't just christian nationalism it was also how do i make an argument that is a strong christian politics that isn't like this weird 20th century development it appeals to the history and at the same time it allows you to be kind of a real man like to be a man uh, who's assertive in politics, who has good reasons for his for his views. Um, and you can do it as this sort of independent, like self-willed guy. And that's why I talked about this a few times in the book. But um, but so anyway, yeah, I, that, that's I'm glad to hear that among kind of the crowd you're you're talking about. Right. And uh, it has, definitely has like the book. Um, all of those points definitely appealed to them. So you did a. a um, just from a rhetorical point of view, um, obviously you didn't necessarily go for the, here are all the classical rhetorical devices that I could use to uh, subtly sway you towards it. Like you said, <laughs> it was very logical and very direct in some cases, um, which yeah. I and a bunch of others appreciated uh, because uh, for the few people that have gone back and read older Christian works, um, like uh, for the Presbyterian stream, I did that with the uh, Presbyterian ministers leading up to the Civil War. Um, with the Lutherans, I did the same thing, uh, just on my own accord. Um, you find that they don't really sound like modern Christians, and in fact, they are very direct, and they will name people, they will name ideas, and all this other stuff that might, that were definitely unpopular or uh, controversial at the time. And they would just say, um, this is how this is, um, this is why it is wrong, and uh, therefore the logical consequence is you are evil if you support it. Um, you, you don't like that's something that I can appreciate because it's very to the point, very informative, and uh, in a way, it's much more academic or much more uh, intellectually appreciative um, than the stuff yeah. that you see in the modern day, where a lot of pastors like to sidestep uh, doctrines or controversies. They like to remain quiet, or they like to uh, use very flowery language to get around it, or sort of affirm it softly. Mm -hmm or give themselves plausible deniability so that whichever way the issue goes, they can say that they were on the correct side. Um, you don't find that in most yeah. of Christian history. Um, and whenever you read the book, uh, The Case for Christian Nationalism, which uh, by the time this goes out should be in the description for uh, everyone watching if they are interested in it, um, it definitely feels older. Um, it feels like it's from a strain or a tradition uh, that isn't as popular now. Um, which is good, especially for the Lutherans, um, because there is a uh, there's a growing group of people within uh, Lutheranism that are, quite frankly, just tired of the uh, of sort of like the last uh, the consensus of the last few decades 
uh, where you're mm -hmm. supposed to play nice with everyone, even though we just keep drifting leftward and leftward. Uh, there are people in your denomination that will affirm things like Marxism and uh, uh, racial privilege and all this other stuff, but you're supposed to play nice with them. Uh, we can't really address the issue because that might split people. Um, it might cause factions to arise and all this other stuff, so we just have to ignore the issue. Um, there's a group of people that is absolutely tired of that, um, which is why whenever you find uh, people like uh, Godestinst is a group, of, a group of Lutherans that will very directly and sort of uh, unabashedly in most cases come out and say, this is wrong, this is evil, this is anti-historical, um, you know, they will get traction. Um, and then Layman, uh, Stone Choir, will do something similar. Um, in fact, I think they had a recent episode where they were saying it is, uh, it is wrong or it is evil to uh, obfuscate the truth. If uh, scripture speaks clearly about something, uh, muddying the waters is itself a, uh, an evil deed. Uh, you know, that, that is leading people astray. Um, so, uh, within Lutheranism at the very least, um, that is a, uh, that's a trend that you see. People are being attracted to all of that, uh, which is why a few months ago, whenever I saw, uh, uh, you know, the case for Christian nationalism ki uh, kicking up a storm with, the, uh, uh, with people supporting it and opposing it, um, I was absolutely overjoyed because it's finally bringing these issues to the front um, mm -hmm. where um, they can't just ignore it um, because the logic makes sense. Um, they haven't refuted the arguments. The only thing that they can muster against it is if you support Christian nationalism, you're a racist or a uh, sexist, uh, you know, you, you're against all these other things that are uh, supposedly good. They don't provide logical counter arguments, really. Yeah. Um, or, or uh, you know, they end up just denying their own tradition, which has been pointed out a few times <laughs> by now. Um, yeah, that's, that's, so, uh, that's, that's been the most frustrating and the funniest part. At the same right. Time. And oh so... They can't just ignore the issue. They have to come out for or against it, which means you can't just rely on the old consensus of, well, we'll just address this at a later convention in bureaucratic detail, and uh, we'll just let the yeah. fire die down on this. You, it's uh, This has forced an issue to the forefront, um, which is happening more and more often. Yeah, and this is like, I remember talking to my wife about this book and she's like, are you seriously going to write with this like dense language in here and, and do all these quotes? Are you, you should make this as simple as possible. And I disagreed with her and uh, I said, no, what what, the, what I need to do is I need to be, this needs to be the, have the best argumentation I can do. Uh, and, you know, like the soundest, like the most, you know, like the yeah, the best argumentation I could do for these, for this argument. And make these bold claims that I knew, like, like you said, it would set some people off. But then when people open the book, they'd be like, wow, he doesn't just state that as if it's a tweet, like he provides arguments for it. Oh, and not only does he have an argument for it, like he cites four or five other people that I like who said the same thing. So it's, it's you know, I'm not like, I'm not saying I'm that the book's perfect. It's not perfect. But my, the point being is that that's what I, the, what I, what I told her is like, no, because then people pick this up. They're gonna they're gonna have to read it. And they're gonna have to deal with it. Like they have to deal with what I say, instead of just like these typical evangelical books where they don't actually demonstrate the conclusion. They just have this. I don't know. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just atrocious. But the yeah. But they 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 had to they actually act, had to contend with the argument, and in the large part, this has been the disappointing thing, uh, is that most not all the reviews, uh, but but most most of the reviews don't directly deal with the arguments I have in the book. It's, um, it's, it's kind of, it's actually very, very kind of frustrating. They, they kind of, they go after the soft targets, which is, uh, um, you know, I guess that's, that's the easy way to go. But, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the point being though, they had to continue. You're exactly right. And that's what I intended to do. And I hope going forward that, um, that I, that this would be an influence in method. I mean, I, I do think, uh, I do hope someone writes a book that's more of a like a biblically art, biblically based argument, and it's been some of the criticism of me is that I didn't use enough enough scripture, um, and but but I'm hoping that that some people who agree with me uh, in general would would ha would produce works and articles that would back would actually go from the scripture out. So I'm I'm a political theory. I call me you know I consider myself a Christian political theorist or Christian political philosopher. And so I approach things from a little bit different, like self-consciously approach things differently. But I, it would be great if a, like a theologian or someone who's um, 
you know, a th yeah, a theologian came back and did a more theological or, a, you know, scriptural based argument. So, Right. And I absolutely love that criticism because in the same breath, you know, one day they will go from supporting uh, who knows what, uh, you know, new fad that's out in the news uh, saying that Christianity absolutely needs to reform itself to support this. And then they'll attack you because you didn't use enough scripture in justifying this thing that existed for, or, yeah, or at least this yeah. method of political organization that existed for centuries in Christendom. So yeah. uh, they want to have it both ways there, where they can not use scripture, but you have to use absolutely every single, you know, I and T in scripture that, you know, has been dotted and crossed. Uh, so, yeah. um, you know, it absolutely I mean, he, worth yeah. pointing out that that's a complete double standard uh, because mm. the people you're targeting or not targeting the people that you're appealing to will notice that and they want that to be called out yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah and i and i think yeah and that that's it's a very very much a pop uh, like a populist move to go to go that route like he didn't he didn't back it up with scripture well well yeah i mean but i explicitly say that i'm going, going to assume the reformed tradition and, and i and i'm going to work from that so uh and and i say that if you want to know the scriptural arguments go to my sources and then i say i even say in the introductions like wow and this is just the first work of hopefully many and i hope other people produce other works that will complete it through scripture um kind of a scriptural theological or biblical theological presentation so uh but yeah i i i felt that 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 was that that objection was a very much a populist appeal, but it wasn't actually a very good one. It was one of those if you actually think about it and know a little bit about the tradition, you can say, yeah, that it's kind of silly. But right, and that's how it goes. And you also keep, uh, you know, if, if, if I remember correctly, what you just said is your wife asked why it wasn't more sort of like simple or dry and direct. Um, yeah, uh, that no, that that was that yeah, that that it should have been shorter and simpler. Right. Yeah. Um, so. You know, that might, however, mean that there is room for any individual out here who is competent enough to just make what might be a Christian nationalist manifesto, because making mm -hmm. a case and making a manifesto are two fundamentally different things. Uh, you know, the yeah. case has to be very intellectually backed and supported. The manifesto um, is basically just describing here is what we want with a very short description of why we want it, uh, which is usually going to be because the current system is wrong. Um, so... Uh, who you know that that might be a uh, a good next step, especially in light of the conversation earlier about organization. Um, mm. If we could agree on just a set of broad principles of, uh, you know, here's what we want out of a Christian nationalist movement across all these different traditions, um, you know, that would uh, that would send a lot of enemies, uh, you know, running scared, <laughs> just because they haven't yeah. had to deal with such a thing before. Uh, yeah, that that would be. I think I did uh, briefly think of the manifesto, but I, I couldn't think of. Yeah, no, that that's great. So I mean, yeah, we should all think about that <laughs> offline. And <laughs> yeah, so with all of that being said, we're almost an hour in at this point. Um, might be good. Uh, I have heard a few criticisms of Christian nationalism or a few questions and all this other stuff. And uh, you know, I'm not saying that you're the uh, you're, you're not exactly some genie that's come out of a bottle that can just snap his fingers and give the perfect answer to absolutely everything to do with Christian nationalism. Um, but I figure if there was ever a question, uh, you would be the guy to put it to, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully we can get an answer out of it. So one of the common objections that I get, um, actually two, we'll start with this sort of like the easy one, the more punchy and eye-grabbing one. Um, from an outsider looking in, um, they might be slightly sympathetic towards Christianity. They can look back through Western history and see that it was Christianity that was at the forefront of basically everything good. Um, it was Christianity that developed Western society, basically. Um, and then they look in the modern day, and the churches, uh, or at least in their view, have all been subverted. Um, therefore, how can Christian nationalism ever work? Because the broad majority of Christians are uh, subverted, I believe, is the word that's usually used. Um, I should make clear, I don't it subscribe to this interpretation of events, um, but that is something that I have heard, especially from uh, people outside. So, uh, you know, what might your response to that sort of line of reasoning be? So the, the, the line of, so I, just so I understand, the, yeah, the yeah. line of reasoning is that the, that Christians broadly won't, would, wouldn't accept this? Yeah, yeah, basically. Um. Yeah, I mean that—that's the task before us. 
Uh, I, this is, um, One of the things, I mean, you keep in mind that that within the last like 30, 40, 50 years, the we were we were able. This is why I don't do evangelical bashing uh, because um, there, there's a lot of squirreliness in in evangelicalism broadly, you know, like that 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 group. But you know, they they were consistently good voters. Um, they were consistently generally good at politics. I mean, I I don't like the neocons. I, I despise George W. Bush, um, and he was like the evangelical candidate. But uh, in general, they're the most reliable voter for politics, and that that's largely because of the work of a, a you know um, of pastors and many men over decades, seventies and eighties, into the nineties. And it was, so we were able to take that that make it a essentially make it a voting block that was extremely powerful and it remains powerful to this day. Uh, and he even voted for Trump twice at eighty percent. So. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to be one of these things where we're going to have to convince, uh, particular the Baptists, uh, like the Tom Askells and and uh, William Wolf's already convinced, I guess. Uh, for yeah, he goes farther than those guys. You, you may not know who I'm talking. You know William Wolf, right? You know yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, who, who who doesn't know that guy? Um, people think he's my brother, and he is. But um, the uh, but then but then there's there's important people on the conservative side in the Baptist world who are kind of on the fence. And I think it's a matter of trying to to help them get a Baptist version of this, and uh, and having that spread through their their networks, uh, and uh, have them convinced. I mean, again, there was this time we still kind of have this voting block. So I'm I'm hoping that that in the in in the next few years we we can we can have some of these ideas permeate out and and make it needs to be more like you know you didn't ask this but. It needs to be more than just we're against the trannies and gays. Okay. That this is what it's a pet peeve of mine. It's a frustration of mine. I'm not, I'm not like defending them, <laughs> that, those people, but uh, I, I'm saying like we, we, I just saw like a, a, a Twitter thread that said, oh, it's Christian nationalism or Christian federalism. So, and the federalism just happens to be against like gays and trannies. It's like, well, that, that's, yeah, okay, we're against that. But it's more than that. You know, it's government ought to, to serve God, it ought to serve the church uh, in in ways that are prudent and all that. Um, uh, uh, it, it's got to be it's got to be higher than this, these earthly ends. Got to be we got to seek this the 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 magistrate ought to look for the for the good of the souls within the within the limits of their power. But it's got to be so it's got to be more than just against the like sexual deviance. Um, but anyway, that, that's part of it. Like we can always get the evangelicals on board with being against transgender, but how do we get them from transgender and go past that and say, no, we need to actually uh, say that, th that that we need the governor to literally to say this is a Christian state and we're going to, um, it, yeah, we're, we're going to make that the norm in some way. How do we get to that? Um, so that, that's what I'm hoping it can happen uh, and to convince the average evangelical of that. But yeah, it's, it's challenging because they, they, they're, I was like, like, as people like to say, they're catechized more from, uh, you know, the, the television or, or Facebook or whatever, more than they are their own pastors and others. But so that, that's the task ahead. I understand it's a, it's a legitimate challenge. Like, what do you do now? Like the world's degenerate, even, even conservative Christians have lousy theology in certain places. How do we, how do, and how do we fight all these, all these influences that have so much power? I mean, it's, it's incredible. I know I keep going on, on tangents here, but it is incredible after gay marriage was forced upon us throughout the entire country. Now it's like what, 70, 80% of a firm gay marriage or something even higher than that. So it's right. Like, so like there is, this, there's a power in, in the regime to enforce and then normalize that we as just, you know, YouTubers or whatever, wherever this is going to go, <laughs> uh, or what we just don't have that. Uh, we can capture like those set of guys. That's why part of me, part of my like cope, I guess, for writing a book with grand ambitions, is at least I got these few guys who are now like self-affirming and and uh, want to be a, like a strong-willed Christian man. Like that that's like the the thing I go back to. I think, well, I at least got that. But anyway, the long-term vision is of course, and and things can change rapidly. I mean, even the American Revolution, the 1770s, no one thought there'd be a revolutionary war, even years before it. Now I'm not calling for revolution, FBI, if you're listening, but um, 
I'm saying things change very rapidly. We we went from being under a king to suddenly being under a republic. A republic. So anyway, yeah, uh, and I, I, things change rapidly. Let's not be like, oh, it's not going to change. Well, yeah, I know. I know liberalism is powerful. I, I got the whole idea that that the, at the end of the world is liberalism, but uh, <laughs> um, it is it is the end until it isn't, and then and then someone has to stand up and say, okay, this is ours, and that's what we're here, what we're about. But right and. Um, certainly you, you brought up, uh, definitely gay marriage being forced upon the country by, say, the judiciary system, um, uh, along with other, uh, you know, you could just as easily say abortion, abortion laws being forced upon the mm. country, which brought about a much more, uh, a much larger contingency of the population in favor of abortion, uh, whereas previously that just didn't exist. And you can go back to many, many other court cases. It's basically how the court operates, um, uh, and that's probably your biggest, uh, uh, the biggest reality in favor of a smaller movement taking power is that you don't necessarily need uh, a giant, uh, a giant popular base in order to get these things through. Um, quite really, you just need the law on your side, uh, or so history seems. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, the, there's the the pedagogical uh, function of the law is extremely powerful and that that's a, you know that's the most <laughs> until recently i mean it's just a fact that if you that if you, when you start punishing something through civil law that it become becomes to like normalize into people this is what like uh this is what like the cartel does and other like gangs do um in in not not this country anymore i guess but but in in foreign countries is that they would like mutilate uh, mutilate people and hang them from a bridge uh and because obviously it's 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 awful, but it, it signals the people that they did something wrong and that they don't do that. And so they, it's a way of like psychological power. Um, but I mean, it sounds it sounds like this is that's obviously bad. But I mean, but but I mean, in terms of civil law, yeah, it has that function of normalizing behavior uh, in people. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's certainly the case. Um, it, it's a matter of actually getting the law passed, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And now uh, I will just so that we can be thorough. Uh, I didn't. I didn't promise an easy discussion. I promised an easy flowing discussion, but I didn't promise that the questions would be easy. Um, okay. The person that believed in that objection might press you and say, "Well, aren't evangelicals responsible for the majority of uh, the majority of popular support for foreign interventions, foreign aid, uh, refugee programs, uh, and all these yep. other things, which are." Uh, uh, definitely from your perspective and probably my perspective, uh, quite insidious. Uh, so, you know, how can we rely on them as a block at all uh, when they're also responsible for vast amounts of foreign aid interventions, uh, um, you know, the sort of warped militarism of the last few decades, uh, refugee programs that have completely uh, uh, yeah. taken over parts of the churches uh, into supporting basically open borders? Uh, it, surely the objector would say uh, this block isn't really that good. Yeah, well, they they voted. I mean, um, Trump was a big disappointment, but uh, candidate Trump uh, had had some great ideas, <laughs> uh, and uh, he got eighty percent of the white evangelical vote. Right, so uh, I I understand. I totally you know, like I, like before. I um, I I despise George W. Bush more than Bill Clinton, uh, and um, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and 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 he was the evangelical candidate, but uh, but nevertheless, I I I they they still voted for Trump, uh, and I I and and uh, yeah, I I mean there, there's still I I, just, I love Tucker, Tucker Carlson. If we get more Tucker Carlsons, that that'll be it. Just have we need a we need the Christian Tucker Carlson. How do we make William Wolf the ticket? The, uh, anyway, uh, may maybe that's the future of uh, of the Wolf uh, of the Wolf Brothers. Is we'll be on the some TV, the PaleoCon TV show. We'll take it. Over. Anyway, we're getting we're off subject here. Um, what what was the objection again? Oh yeah, the, so the evangelicals that they they are they're salvageable. Don't we we shouldn't be. I I know there's like that instinct. Oh, I want to like the evangelicals this and that, but I I really think that we should uh, be grateful. In general, they are much better. They're more reliable than like Roman Catholics, despite all their tradition and all that. They, like Democrats vote. I mean, they vote for Democrats, but these guys vote for Republicans. 
Republicans are terrible, but it's the best thing we got, and we can operate within that party. Uh, so I, I don't know. I I get the criticism. Right, and that's but, you know, that's basically just what I wanted to address there because uh, um, especially when I see some people advocating for Christian nationalism, it seems like they get that objection, uh, and I don't know if it ever reaches them. I just know that the objection is lodged, um, and I don't know that I've heard anyone uh, sort of address it. So. Um, okay. yeah, you know, coming from your mouth, especially, you know, the idea that the evangelicals are in fact not the worst block out there, uh, no, no, might, they are not. <laughs> might seem radical to some people that are especially looking for a black pill. Uh, but, uh, I don't think you're necessarily going to find that there. They're not perfect, obviously. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling they are better than, um, definitely than blocks in other countries where Christians aren't even a majority block. So... Yeah. Or, a, or an influential block. So, yes, yeah, as, as I understand it, yeah, the America is unique in having this very kind of like reliable voting block for like religious voting block that isn't like ethnic. You know what I mean? But like this non-ethnic, whatever you want to call it, you know, voting block. So, right. Yeah. So, that's a. I, I do feel like they get bashed needlessly too much. Um, and in fact, if you think that I'm going soft on them now, you can look at my. Uh, at some of my prior discussions where I have, in fact, talked about how they are wrong. Um, but there is such thing as falling off too far on the other side. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they aren't your enemy. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 I, yeah. It's It goes back to what we said earlier is that we have to think in terms of, of coalitions and and that, that even means, like you know, hanging out with the the really weird um, Pentecostals sometimes. <laughs> I don't know uh, that. That, that they, they can be kind of wild, but, um, you know, they even might, uh, maybe not the oneness Pentecostals, maybe the, the, you know, the heretical ones, but the ones who just like a good time, I guess. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, and I, so this might tie into the other conversation as a neat segue, but, uh, I remember one of my friends, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, who does the stone choir podcast, uh, hopefully by now my audience knows of them. Um, he was basically just saying, uh, when asked about the sort of the variety amongst Protestants, you know, how if you're advocating Christian nationalism, then surely you, the Lutheran, will be fine with a Baptist king or something like that. And the uh, uh, my friend basically just replied, yes, that, that would be much better than what we have right now. Uh, I would take a Baptist king, a Presbyterian king, uh, over the current system. And that's just because... Um, you, you can't lose your head in all this. You can't, uh, you can't become rash. Um, there is such a thing as a better outcome here. Um, there is such a thing as a perfect outcome that you probably won't get. Um, so, all of that being said, though, uh, you know, step back just a little bit. Um, have you ran across the criticism of, if you want America to be a Christian nation, uh, how do you reconcile that goal with the... Uh, with the extreme variety of confessional uh, of confessions just among American yeah. uh, citizens, you know, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, uh, the progressive Christians, the non-Christians, um, all these people are in the country. Uh, what do you do about them in the through the lens of Christian nationalism? Hmm. Yeah. So if we. Uh, I, I, I do, I, you know, I, I'm going to talk about federalism. So I do think federalism is important in our context. Oh, we can't get away from it, but it actually needs to be strengthened. So what each state does uh, is, is, is okay by me. I'm kind of put it that way. Uh, so the, but yeah, so that, that's in terms of the political arrangements, I think states should have just, just as, you know, uh, after the, after the founding, the states had a lot of power. There were established churches for, for 30, 40 years um, after. And uh, so I, I think there can be uh, actually significant power or at least some kind of, yeah, so at the state level. For, that doesn't really resolve the problem exactly, but it does make it more local. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll go back and it's what I've said, what I said in the book uh, and other places that uh, I, I call it pan-Protestant, uh, meaning that uh, not that non-Protestants can't be a part of it, but that the the governing principle is going to be a Protestant principle. And I, I, I talked to a Lutheran, Lutheran Lutheran pastor on the phone, and he he's actually much more. Um, he, he doesn't actually 
care for a lot of the re religious liberty language in the book. So I wonder as a Lutheran, how do you guys under believe it? You know, I, I thought, yeah, I, but I've been, I've got pushback from Lutherans from people saying, I don't like this pan Protestant idea. It sounds way too Anglo, uh, which is, you know, fair enough. Um, and may, may be true, but anyway, you got a pan Protestant principle, which means that people that, that, uh, that your, your salvation is not tied to your institutional uh, membership. It's not a visible thing fundamentally, like your, 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 your salvation. And for that, for that reason, you can't, you, you can, so a, a Presbyterian and, a, and a, a church next to a Baptist church, you can both, both mutually affirm that you are Christian churches, uh, spiritual brothers, despite your disagreement, because you don't, neither of you think that being in one church or the other as a visible institutional thing is the ground of your salvation or, you know, um, is, is, uh, I guess say essential to your, your salvation. Uh, and for, so as pan Protestant, what I mean then is that we can, we can see our country as a Protestant country, not necessarily denominationally aligned, not with a, you know, the, the enforcement top down enforcement of this particular confession, uh, but that we, uh, but we would see each other as spiritual brothers in a Protestant uh, society, uh, and so for that reason, it would be religious. So it wouldn't have to be tied to a confession. Wouldn't have to be tied to any kind of one tradition. Uh, and and I think this was 19th century America largely. I know there's problems in 19th century America, but there was, you know, there's all these debates about was the founding Christian. But then if you just go to 1800, even through like the 1930s, oh, I mean, even Dwight, uh, FDR said the word Christian nation. So from 1800 all the way like into the Eisenhower administration beyond, the notion was we're a Christian nation. It was already there despite our diversity. Uh, it wasn't institutionalized at the, at the civil level, but it was a common understanding among people. And even like Tocqueville in his Democracy in America, he says that... Um, that even if you weren't a true believer, you still had to act as one. You still kind of had to affirm I'm Christian. You had, you had to lie, essentially. You had to be um, like hypocritical. But but the, the point being is you had to do that because culturally, socially, uh, this was a Christian country. And to be a non-Christian was to be essentially an outsider. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, a, a sort of infidel, I guess. Um, so that's that's like my vision, and uh, if, if that makes some sense, and I, I think it's principled. I think this is the important one. I'm not. It's not like a. I think it's a, a principled Protestant position. It's not simply a compromise, uh, you know, because we have to do it. It's actually a principled position because we can affirm each other's mutual faith that that these churches are true churches despite our differences. Okay, it's a. So that that's why I think it's and so I begin like if that if I did hear that Lutherans don't like that idea, <laughs> right? Uh, which so, just disappoints me. But <laughs> well, um, the Lutheran doctrine of you know visible and invisible churches um, does differ from the Reformed. I'm not going to get into it because one, that's not the purpose of this uh, okay. uh, of my stream, and two, I'm absolutely god awful at arguing theology, which is uh, why I don't really do it, and. Uh, uh, an ever so slightly uh, contributing factor for why I try to tell people, uh, you know, arguing theology is not the uh, most productive thing you could do. Um, obviously, when I say that, I, uh, you know, I actually want productivity, but uh, it's also just because I hate getting theological questions because I'm not the guy to answer them. There are thousands of other people that can answer them better than I could. Um, all of that being said, though, um, so the uh, language surrounding things like religious liberty um, it doesn't surprise me that there are Lutherans that are against that, um, especially on the more conservative side. Um, mm. <laughs> the sort of uh, the idea that floats around is that the very scattered religious landscape of America um, is in large part due to a very Anglican idea of religious liberty uh, that sort of took mm. hold in the United States, which I have some historical problems with just saying it's Anglican, but Anglo, definitely. Um, all of that being said, though, um, whenever you bring it into the context of this stuff could just be determined on a more local level, um, you brought up states. Um, in a previous discussion of mine, I was talking about, like, counties or cities, uh, which would be 
uh, it would be difficult to navigate, certainly, which is the argument against localizing things to that level is, uh, you know, you have to keep track of which small thing is which. Um, but that's kind of what Americans did before you had laws uh, regarding, uh, uh, I don't know how you would necessarily put it. I think they technically came in with things like segregation and civil rights, uh, which would prevent people from having a closed off community based off of a characteristic like that. Um, but if you look through American history, you would find areas that were very strongly within a state, you know, this town was Presbyterian, this town was Baptist, this town is Anglican, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you could see that on, the, on a larger scale. Um, you definitely had a more Anglican South and a more Congregationalist Northeast. Um, but even amongst the South, you could find very small localities that would differ with each other. And the solution that I put out, and I would like to hear your, uh, your take on it, um, would be that people would just naturally sort this out if you gave them the liberty to. Um, that is, if this is such a giant issue, um, having a Christian nation with all these different confessions, um, if that is such a uh, big issue for people that it's causing instability, um, I would posit that they would just reorganize. Uh, you know, if it's uh, such a big deal now that the nation is explicitly Christian and that is its goal, um, and that's for whatever reason causing Lutherans and Presbyterians to be able, unable to live next to each other or whatever else. You, you can go with the nightmare scenario there. Um, that's not, the, you know, the curtain doesn't fall and that's just the end of Christian nationalism. They would take measures to counteract that that wouldn't necessarily be violent or destructive. Um, just because I, I feel like whenever you, I get this objection, I'm sure you've probably gotten something similar to it. Um, the underlying fear is that we're going to have, like, the 30 years war in the United States for which confession is going to lead the Christian nation, mm. which yeah. uh, uh, seems very counterintuitive, especially considering that a lot of, uh, um, especially early religious laws in this country had the 30 years war in mind and the religious wars in Europe, uh, specifically trying to avoid it on these shores. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like that's against the character of, who you're, of the people you're dealing with, specifically Americans. Um, but even if you were to take the nightmare scenario, I would posit um, that it would eventually just work out as people would, uh, you know, move away from people they didn't want to be with. Um, but, you know, perhaps I've missed something here that goes against uh, the idea of Christian nationalism. Yeah, I think you're right that people would be able to sort it out. I, I guess that there would be some, like, level, like, um, issues at town and in, in the city level, because usually the, the state has a lot of power over counties. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it, constitutionally, the federal government should not have as much power over states, but states do have a lot of power over, you know, counties and cities and towns. So uh, th there would be, there would be that issue. I think too, the, uh, and I'm, I'm actually just realizing this over the last like few days after <laughs> encountering these things called Lutheran. Um, and, it makes me wonder that maybe that my conception and I'll admit that my conception of religious liberty is actually very Anglo. It, it is very, uh, it's developed from the Anglo Scott, you know, Scottish, uh, you know, like the, the interaction that happened mainly, you know, in, in, in Britain and then Northeast or just, and then America, uh, from, you know, from, oh well, yeah, like 16th century up, up through even 19th century. So I, I can see that. And if, if that's, I, I guess that means if I say it's a pan Protestant, I, I wouldn't want to exclude Lutherans, but that Lutherans would be, would be able to kind of start their own schools, have their own communities. If, if they wanted to have this more, uh, we're, you know, we're Lutherans and we're going to keep separate mindset. Uh, if it kind of, kind of like Jews and kind of like Roman Catholics were, um, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I'm not, I want to say Lutherans have to be second class citizen or like that, but I'm just, I'm just trying to think through, like if, if we wanted to make this thing work, it would be, I think there would be people, a lot of traditions, a lot of Protestant, you know, traditions and denominations that would be willing to actually be part of this, this kind of like pan Protestant arrangement so that the public schools would be Christian, uh, but it wouldn't be. You know, they wouldn't be necessarily teaching pedo baptism or something like that. They, they'd have a catechism, uh, you know, Westminster or whatever, and then they, they'd learn these. They'd learn these these catechism questions. That they'd learn Bible reading. They'd learn how to speak. Uh, they'd learn how to 
uh, read using the Bible, that sort of thing. Uh, and but then if someone if a group didn't want to take part of that, they can just open their own uh, up their own schools. I mean, that, so that's one right. arrangement to reconcile that. And no, I don't know what you think about that. But but I, like to me, I just know Presbyterians and Baptists could start a school together and generally get along. So uh, and but I, I don't do. know if Presbyterians and Lutherans can do that uh, and get along. I so just don't, just don't know. Uh, so this is uh, actually interesting because in Lutheran history, like in the early 1900s, maybe even in the 1800s, um, there was a big push against public schools to the point where the LCMS basically forbade um, LCMS Lutherans from attending them. Uh, and this was before. I mean, that, that's you, Roman Catholics too. I mean, that that's that was part of the yeah. Right, and and that's before you had the sort of 1960s. We're going to force the First Amendment to mean uh, you know state atheism. Uh, this is like you know 1910s, 1920s, 1930s uh, when yeah. most people uh, would uh, can very reasonably consider the public schools to be very Christian in nature. Um, the Lutherans at the time were uh, uh, saying that they are never going to be Christian. All this other stuff. Um, so. This does go into the history a little bit, and uh, Lutherans do like to be very separate. And in fact, the LCMS is sort of uh, uh, founded on that. You have a lot of its early uh, founders trying to escape the state church in Germany, which was trying to force a uh, a false unity, if you will. Which uh, you know, and I, I actually in the last stream that I did with Mr. Grant Brooks, the uh, other Presbyterian. Um, he spoke against this from the Calvinist side, which I hadn't heard before. So it doesn't seem to be a, uh, a Lutheran complaint by any means. All of that to say, surely it wouldn't, uh, within this conception, surely it wouldn't on let automatically relegate one to a second-class citizen if you wanted to be separate from the uh, larger project. Um, surely mm. it would be perfectly feasible to say, in parallel with all this, um, the Lutherans can just have Lutheran communities, Lutheran schools, and all this other stuff. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the idea is that you'd still live in a Christian community, uh, and so you'd have the benefit of a sort of Christian society, but you'd also have that benefit of being kind of the exception to the rule. You'd have your own separate thing going on. Um, I don't which, know, the, the, which would the, incur the, more cost, but it does anyways already. Yeah, you know, it's not a... Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think... A, I think that the uh, if you were to accept all of this, it would basically just be you can go and do what you want if you can do it. Uh, you know, you can be separate um, as Lutherans, uh, and you have to do it yourself, which, you know, that's the cost of independence. I think this is a good reason why Lutherans should just lighten up, and they should be like the Anglos <laughs> and be tolerant. <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, Ooh, you just and, and uh, just jo join join the tradition join the great <laughs> liberty tradition you know and uh you could just be all we could all be you know one together <laughs> like you know? i said uh i'm not going to turn this into a theological debate because that's not my <laughs> thing by any means but uh uh, you have definitely just invited a conversation thereafter on this uh <laughs> uh enjoy um no, but actually, no. One of the things I do like, yeah. I will say this: that, that Lutherans have this, and I'd, I'd say they should quote, they should lean into this. Um, sound gay to say that, but they, they should. What they should do is lean in to the fact that they like being Lutheran, and it's almost like a quasi-ethnic group. They're all Germans, and you know, good, good for you. But like, lean into that like ethnic distinctive, and just go, and run with it. I mean, I'd, so I know that not all Lutherans are. German and but uh but I, I, there is a sort of ethnic component to this I guess I, I think or at least there's a whatever it is and I I'd say that's good and uh and if um and I think that's one reason why Lutherans might like my book is because they I kind of say that that like you, you should like that distinctive you should um you know you should kind of rally behind that that identity um uh, but. Yeah, um, it, it would be a very strange to see an Anglican church, kind of like we see in the modern day, that de-emphasizes the Anglo nature of the whole thing. Well, um, you'd be surprised. That's uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, nowadays the Anglo church, the Anglican church is the universal church. You yeah, just, yeah, uh, yeah. Do anyway, uh, which, anyway. <laughs> which is very sad because... No one uh, realizes they're actually practicing English customs, do they? Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's one of those weird things like, no, we're a church for everyone. Well, yeah, you are, but I mean, you kind of are everyone's doing the same thing that that came from the same place from the same people and 
you know, for over hundreds of years. But anyway, right. I'm going to get myself and, in trouble. Well, I mean, uh, you can use the Anglicans as an example, um, especially throughout the Victorian and the Edwardian ages. Um, they were producing very beautiful music, very beautiful stained glass, very beautiful churches, very, you know, everything about it was a, a very beautiful expression of Anglo nature. Um, and that's not to say that if you want to have beauty, you have to be Anglo. Um, it is saying that there is a, uh, uh, an ethnic component that perhaps just springs out of the uh, fourth commandment itself that you are supposed to honor your lineage, uh, starting with your father and mother. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it turns out that if you do honor these things, you are going to produce something that is genu genuinely beautiful. Um, the Lutherans used to do this once upon a time. Uh, they have, in the last few uh, decades, de-emphasized the more German aspect of their nature, uh, down to the liturgy and all this other stuff. But um, once upon a time, uh, there were very beautiful German customs that were in the LCMS, I'm sure that you could probably find a Scottish equivalent or a Scotch-Irish equivalent with the Presbyterians, um, which, personally, I would like to defend just for the sake of preserving uh, uh, what I would view as uh, uh, customs that I am descended from. I would like to see um, a, a very English Anglican church. I would like to see a very German Lutheran church. Not to say that you exclude people on the basis of race or lineage, um, but that the cultural expressions within them uh, the adiaphora, as you uh, uh, might hear in some uh, confessions or creeds, um, you know, they, they should be defended as you have received them. They are, in fact, an inheritance, which is good. Yeah, unless you're, unless you're, you know, Scottish Presbyterian, you don't, you don't believe in adiaphora stuff. So, <laughs> right, uh, but, right. Which, yeah. um, but, but surely, uh, you could get the gist of what I'm saying here. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know what you're saying yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, I mean, it is it's Scottish Presbyterian, so it's uh, it's <laughs> it's rejection of it is itself Scottish. Um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, that, that's that's good. So it, it turns out you guys are kind of odd. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, and <laughs> the, I think most friends. people would accept that. Um, uh, I I think it was uh, Reverend Fisk, uh, who is a sort of a, a lot of uh, more sound Lutherans will definitely know who he is. Um, and in fact, I sort of started near his circle uh, before I was doing all my own stuff. Um, you know, he, he will basically just say, you, if you are Lutheran, you kind of have to emphasize your weirdness. Otherwise, you get drawn <laughs> into other things that make you not Lutheran. Um, and and that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, as now that I am Lutheran, there are parts of, say, the Baptists that I find strange. But I wouldn't expect the Baptists uh, to conform due to my... Uh, you know, my perception of what is and isn't weird. I would hope that one day they would become Lutherans, but I don't, uh, in the meantime, want them to just succumb to whatever stronger cultural force is there to make them not weird. Uh, you know, the, yeah, there, there's a drive to become fashionable and respectable that will destroy something that is good. Yeah, that's... Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, keep, keep uh, Christianity weird. Isn't that what all the New Yorkers say? <laughs> so, keep... So, with all that being said, um, let's see. I know you said you probably didn't want to go too terribly late, um, so I don't know how much time you have, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I should probably head out pretty soon. I gotta, yeah, I gotta, gotta head to the gym a little bit later. But but let's, uh, yeah, yeah. You can go in a few minutes. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, in the wrapping up part, um, we, we've covered a lot of objections. We've covered a lot of, uh, you know, the methodology behind what you were going through. Um, you know, all very good. Um, now, within the right, um, there is a very strong non-Christian contingent, um, which has grown over the past uh, decade, especially. Um, just one, as society becomes less and less Christian. Um, you can definitely see it more pronounced in Europe, but especially in the United States, I've seen a lot more uh, non-Christians on the right, I guess would be a, a, a way of putting it. Um, how will Christian nationalism treat non-Christians? Uh, you know, I'm not asking for a, uh, you know, a capitulation or a compromise uh, by any means. It is a very direct que uh, question. What happens to the non-confessing Christians um, or the non-Christian... Uh, people in the United States, if it does become Christian nationalist, uh, you know what what happens to the outside groups now that we've discussed the uh, the other Christians. 
Uh, yeah. Well, I should say first of all that it, it could it, it will look different in different places. But I think what one of the the, the absolute principle uh, would be that that no no country or no no state should tolerate uh, people who are going to be detrimental to the religious purpose, the religious end of the the state or the religious end of the people. Um, or their their toleration should not go to the point where they're actually, yeah, like allowing harm by by people in a religious sense. Uh, and so what that could mean is that means, yeah, like the atheists should not have should not hold public office. Atheists should be in, in society kind of look look down down upon. you know, like we talked about Tocqueville, that no one wants to publicly be a non-Christian. Uh, so that that's more through society, social pressure, and culture. Uh, I, I think certainly there should be, um, if not like a, a, a official religious test, there should be at, le at least be a demand when you vote that the person has Christian credentials. So, but I'm talking about atheists now. So I, I think, again, this depends on, uh, depends on where you're at, but uh, I, I, certainly in the United States, there, there, uh, like Jews could, would have their own synagogues. Jews would have could have their own schools or universities. Even uh, same with thing with like if Roman Catholics. I mentioned Lutherans as well. I'm not saying not Christians, but but it would be that general principle is that people would be extended this exception. But the point is that it would be an exception to the rule. So nowadays, under secularism, the Christians become the exception. This is true wherever we go now. Now, whenever we do constitutional, like we're fighting for our constitutional rights. We're fighting essentially to get an, to become an exception to to the rule. The rule is no religious uh, discrimination this for this three, but no, we can get an exception because uh, our doctrine says homosexuals can't be ministers or something like that, right? So we're, we're we're fighting for the exceptions. Where I'm saying though, Christianity would be the rule, and people would then have to request have some kind of exception to that. Uh, and I, I think, and, and the United States has a, the United States uh, for a long time was able to, to affirm itself as Christian without saying, you know, you Jews can't live here or, you know, we, we, we didn't permit religious violence. We were, we could be a self-confident Christian people without that sort of thing and still affirm people's religious liberty. So I think the big, like, I, I just, my, to me, the one thing is just atheism. Like, that that itself, it doesn't matter if the atheist is ethnically Jew or ethnically Anglo or ethnically German, the atheist is going to get crushed. <laughs> that's uh, the bottom line. No toleration for atheists. And that's just classical liberalism. I mean, John Locke, John Locke didn't like the atheist. He was, he was, uh, he said, everyone can, we, well, we can tolerate everyone except the atheist. I mean, also Roman Catholics. But, uh, we're not going there, but yeah, the atheist. No, so does that does that answer the question? Well, uh, yeah, no, and definitely there is a precedent in uh, especially most Christian societies that if you can't affirm a higher power for which you will answer your wrongdoings, uh, then it makes you very untrustworthy just at the outset. Uh, which um, you mentioned John Locke, but it's by no means relegated to just him. Uh, the argument was basically if you can't affirm that you know you will answer come judgment, uh, I have no reason to trust your word. Uh, you know, your your word has no intrinsic merit. It just has merit because I, uh, uh, I know that you affirm that God exists, and you will therefore act accordingly. Uh, so yeah, and I also, I mean, atheists tend to have the the worst political views. I mean, it's just if, apart from even that, they just have terrible. Um, I, I absolutely think that should be like we should take all the evidence from elections and all the to like demographics. And be like atheists, you have terrible voting patterns. You don't get to vote anymore. Just be like, I think that would just be one, you know, the evidence of the principle more than anything. But um, yeah. right. And then a uh, very quick question, and then and then we'll wrap up. Um, there's going to be some person uh, that thinks that they're uh, very uh, intelligent, making a comment. Uh, isn't this just the Protestant version of Roman Catholic integralism? And wasn't that a major disaster for? Uh, uh, you know, basically right-leaning policies. Uh, that, you know, there's a uh, outside the center right. There is a farther right critique of Roman Catholic integralism that's saying it basically disregards 
uh, things like ethnic lineage. It disregards, uh, uh, you know, actual right wing policies in government. Uh, yeah. You know, it's basically a, a de radicalizing force. Um, there is going to be someone that will say, is this not just the same version, but for Protestants? Uh, isn't this just going to de radicalize them? Yeah. Will it compromise its, uh, its principles of, you know, the actual right wing part when it gets into power, if it ever does? Uh, you know, how would you answer something like that? Yeah, I think that is a legitimate fear uh, because there is a tendency, of course, if I mean, if we actually have the will to create a Christian national state, this might not, not may not be actually that big of a deal. But at this point, it's it's a fair question because the it, it is the case uh, that, yeah, that Christians Christians would, would have power and then they'd ultimately use that for these highly moralistic ends. That would be actually self-destructive for the nation. And it would be a sort of like Roman Catholic. In, 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 what I don't like about integralism is they say, okay, you're baptized, you're in. Like, they, like you know, like the, they are, the, the, their, their concept of the nation is cent this ecclesiocentric uh, conception, which you're baptized, you're in, come on in, that kind of idea. And, uh, but there, there are Protestants who think that. In fact, I, a lot of Protestants who think that. Uh, even the ones who think they're radical and based and all that, they they think that as well. Um, and, but then, of course, like the squirrely ones too, they they also kind of affirm something like that. Well, they're Christian, then let's let them all right. Um, and in the book, I explicitly argue against that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I think it's a legitimate fear because there is an abuse of Christianity, abuse of Christian principles that can lead to sort of moralizing that then is very self-destructive. Uh, and, and, but th that's, but it, the problem with integralism, is like, it's built into their framework to do that. Whereas I think within a Christian nationalist, it's like a Protestant Christian nationalism. It's not built into the framework, but it's easy to slip into that as a, like a moralizing thing. Like, you know, um, so, so I, I yeah, I, I would say, it's a legitimate fear it has to be watched and we have to watch out for that, but it doesn't, it's not necessary. Like part of the reason that I wrote the book and I include included that controversial chapter on nation and ethnicity is to argue that no, like if you understand nature and grace, you understand the nature of the gospel and the fall and all these other things, then no, you can actually have a Christian people peoples and each people is a distinct culturally people and, and uh, like ethnically distinct. And just becoming a Christian doesn't bring you into the same one world nation. It doesn't eliminate diff cultural difference. And so those have to be affirmed. And that, that was one of the big reasons I not, you know, that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book was to try to show a theological framework that is not just Wolf coming up, you know, imagining things, but actually rooted in the tradition, the reformed tradition. And I think Lutherans could find it as well with their two kingdom theology and other things. Could affirm it just as well, but um, uh, but yeah, like that, that's the point. Uh, that's it's, if if you get the the traditional theology right and apply it right, there's then you can affirm nations, distinct nations that are each Christian, um, and can be can be in in a sense like separate nations, right? And rightly so. Um, you know, Christianity yeah. is not a homogenizing, leveling force. In fact, it uh. Right. It defends these things. So, this uh, is where like Lutherans it, it, and class Protestant, you know, like classical, like Presbyterians and mm -hmm. Anglicans can get along a lot because that's like two kingdom theology. We're all two kingdoms. I know we, uh, it's coming back and it should come back. And all there's, there's a lot of dumb stuff around that. But, uh, that's one thing I think we can get along with a lot with, uh, two kingdom theology. All righty. Maybe yeah. we can talk about that another time. That would actually be a good discussion. Yeah, and um, if if we are going to go into uh, you know hammering out actual theological differences, that will be a very select part of my audience that will find that uh, productive <laughs> and interesting. However, um, it is something that I'm personally interested in. I might as well you know bring on the uh, uh, you know other people as well so that we have a panel discussion. Uh, you know, actually, we could find out how how do we hammer out these issues. Uh, uh, so that being said, we've already just set the stage for a, uh, a follow-up discussion or interview or panel. Yeah. Uh, so um, I will uh, doubtlessly have your uh, uh, various links in the description for people to find you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, but 
just in case they don't look, uh, where could they find you? Uh, your work, uh, where are you active? Uh, Twitter uh, accounts, YouTube's, uh, books. Yeah, you, you can find me Find me on Twitter, Stephen Wolf. Uh, you should be able to find me. Um, it's uh, the, the handle is at perf in just, perf in just. Don't ask me where I got that. Uh, P E R F I N J U S T, perf in just. Uh, you, you'll find me. I got the blue check. Yeah, I pay for Twitter. Um, I think that's that's mainly. I have articles around like American Reformer. Um, yeah, that's about it, I guess. You, you could you could buy the book. I'll be in um, I'll be in D.C. I don't have my calendar, of course, but um, well, I guess maybe, maybe I could tell you afterwards. You can put it in the notes because I'll be in D.C. speaking at George Washington University. Yeah. Okay. And, and people, if they're in the area, they might want to check it out. Yeah, and I'm sure the people interested in that can just go follow you on Twitter, and I'm sure you will have some sort of announcement. Or yeah, I'll publicize there. myself, yeah. 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 So, um, that all being said, uh, and the link for the book will be in the description uh, by the time this goes out, so um, if you are interested in this, if you are interested in the question of how can right-wing Christians uh, better organize and better uh, present themselves to actually win, uh, this would be a good place to start. Um, by no means is it fully comprehensive or the silver bullet uh, for us winning, but it is very, very vital, um, at the very least, for the discussion that is brought forth, uh, you know, shattering false unity within various different churches, um, and at most, uh, providing a framework for which uh, uh, these various Christians can actually win. So, Mr. Wolf, thank you for joining, and I look forward to having you on in the future. Um, if you like the work that I do, uh, you and the audience, uh, you can, uh, there are various ways to donate, uh, one of which will be in the description, uh, the subscribe star. Uh, so any last words, Mr. Wolf? No, All right. <laughs> no, well, I don't, but, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I will, uh, see you all next week. Have a good rest of your morning and goodbye everyone.